Uh, welcome back. In the last lecture, we introduced the water model on the complete graph. Uh, and this time we are going to uh, introduce the topic of martingales and show how they can be used to analyze the uh, probability of the water of the waters reaching consensus uh, on one of the given opinions and how this depends on the initial condition. Uh, okay, so just to recall quickly, last time we uh, uh, described the time evolution of the water model as a continuous time Markov chain uh, on the state space 0, 1, up to n. Uh, and we said in the long run, there are only two possibilities. Either the Markov chain hits the state 0 and gets absorbed in it or hits the state n and gets absorbed in it. All other states are transient. Okay, and we want to calculate the probability that we hit this absorbing state n before hitting the absorbing state zero. And we want to know how this probability depends on the initial condition k. So we start with k voters with opinion one and minus k with opinion zero. And we want to know how likely it is that we hit n before zero. Uh, okay, so, uh, so that's how far we got. And we said we are going to answer this question using martingales. So let's now define martingales. Uh, so let xt uh, be, now it's time is going to be discrete to start with. Uh, xt is a discrete time process and it takes values in the real numbers. So for any given t, xt is going to be, uh, take a value in the real numbers. So this is a bit more like the deck root model than the water model. Uh, xt takes real values. Uh, and then uh, we, we say that such a stochastic process is a martingale if the following is true. So if I tell you everything that happened up to time t, including the value of xt, then the expected value of the state at time t plus one is equal to xt. Okay, so the expectation at time t plus one is the same as the value at time t. Uh, I'm being a bit vague here about what I mean by history up to time t. Uh, usually this just means all the values excess for S up to T. And if the process is Markovian, that's all the information you need. Uh, sometimes you need more. Uh, XT may be defined as a function of some other Markov process. So let me remind you uh, of a homework problem from problem sheet one, where the weather was one of three states uh, and uh, then you defined another process, which is whether Alice carries an umbrella or not. Uh, and that was not Markovian. So in that example, the history up to time T might involve uh, knowing the weather for every day in the past and not just knowing whether Alice carried an umbrella or not. Uh, it, so it might depend a little bit on context. I'm going to leave this vague and it should be clear from context what we mean by history up to time t. Uh, but the claim is that if you're given uh, a sufficiently detailed history up to this time, then the, this conditional expectation should be the same as the value at time t. Okay, and a process with this property is called a martingale. Uh, okay, and uh, this is the only thing we need, but um, uh, I should just tell you for completeness. So if this equal is replaced by greater or equal to for all possible times and all possible histories, then this is called a sub martingale. And if it's replaced by a less than or equal to, it's called a super martingale. And these processes are also uh, interesting and important in their own right. But for this course, we don't need them. We just need martingales. Uh, okay. 
okay i should also mention that this is a distinct property from xt being a markov chain and there's no relation between the two so something can be a markov chain and not a martingale or the other way around or it can be both or it can be neither uh, okay and intuitively intu intuition is important so what is a martingale intuitively it's uh, the way to think of it is you you are you have a fair game you are gambling and against in a fair casino uh, and your fortune is a random process it depends on both on the outcomes of the games you play but also how much uh, so you have a certain amount of money you don't bet at all when you play a game you bet some fraction of it uh, and so the way your fortune evolves over time is a martingale if the games are fair. Uh, it uh, doesn't depend on, uh, uh, so you, you might bet all your money, you might bet a tiny fraction of it, you might bet a fraction that depends on the history. You might say, uh, if I won the last three games, I'm going to bet a bigger fraction than if I did not. Uh, but the point is that if there's no information from the past that, um, that if the games are independent and they are fair, then your fortune will evolve, like uh, will uh, satisfy this property. Uh, the conditional expectation cannot change if you cannot look into the future. You can't come up with a complicated strategy that uh, always makes money for you or even an expectation. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's intuitively what a martingale is. Um, stopping times, but let let me motivate them before defining them. So we defined a martingale by saying that the conditional expectation one time step later is the same as the current value, and you can do this repeatedly. So the conditional expectation two time steps from now is the same as what it was one time step from now and then you take conditional expectations. Again, by repeatedly using the tower rule, you can conclude uh, that uh, for a martingale, the expected fortune at any later time t is the same as your initial fortune. Okay, in expectation, it cannot change if you are playing a fair game at every time step. So this is true for any fixed T. And we can ask the question, does this equality also hold for random T rather than fixed T? So maybe I decide to stop gambling when I reach a target value. So I start, I go into the casino with 50 pounds and I'm going to stop gambling when I've made a thousand pounds. Of course, I might also make zero pounds and might be forced to stop gambling at that time as a result. Uh, but I'm going to keep playing until my fortune either reaches zero or a thousand. And that doesn't happen at a fixed time. That happens at a random time. And is it true that at this random time, my expected fortune is the same as what I started with? Okay, so... Uh, this doesn't hold for all possible random times. In particular, it doesn't hold if, I, if the random time was defined in a way that depends on the future. Uh, if I say I want to stop uh, one time step before I hit zero, so somebody, uh, so somehow I will know when I'm going to hit zero and I want to stop one time step before that, then this equality doesn't hold. Okay, so you're not allowed to look into the future, but how, how do we make precise this notion of uh, not being allowed to look into the future? Okay, so we, we now have this definition. Uh, random time T is called a stopping time. Uh, if for any fixed T, uh, this event, so if, if we want to ask, so fix a value of T, let's say 75, uh, and you want to ask, has this random time capital T happened before time 75? So if I'm in the casino, 
have I either reached my goal of a thousand or become bankrupt before I played 75 games. And it should be possible to determine this by only knowing what happened up to time t. Without looking into the future, you should be able to decide whether uh, I have, um, I've reached this random time capital T. And a random time which has this property for every possible little t is called a stopping time. Um, another intuitive way you can think of this is in terms of giving directions to someone. Uh, so uh, if you want to give someone directions to your house, you, you might give directions of the form, uh, keep walking up uh, White Ladies Road, uh, up the hill and go past the Clifton Down Sainsbury's and turn left at the second turning after uh, the Saints Bridge. So that's an example of a way of giving directions that's easy to follow. Uh, here's another way of giving directions. Walk up White Ladies Road and take the fifth left turn before you reach uh, the Downs. Now, this is not a very helpful way of giving directions because you don't know when you reach that point that you are five left turns away from reaching the downs. You have to go all the way up to the downs and backtrack. So that's a bad way of giving directions. And a stopping time is a good way of giving directions. You should be able to determine whether that's happened without going ahead into the future and seeing what happens. Okay, so that's a stopping time. Uh, okay, and um, yeah, so far I've just been talking about history up to time t somewhat loosely. And the reason I've chosen to be loose is that the way to be precise requires measure theory. Uh, that's not a prerequisite for this unit. And uh, I assume that relatively few of you have done measure theory. So for those of you who have, I'm including more a more precise definition, but uh, the rest of you can just ignore it. You don't need to know this. And so long as we are in agreement on the somewhat imprecise notion of what history up to time t means, uh, then we are on the same page. Okay, so that's for discrete time. Uh, and conceptually, things are easier in discrete time. That's why I introduced them in that context. Uh, but our process, water model, lives in continuous time. And so we need the de de to extend the definition to continuous time martingales. And conceptually, there's no big leap here. It's very similar. So we have uh, xt, now time is continuous, it's indexed by the real numbers, say the positive reals, uh, is a stochastic process. And again, it should take values in the real numbers. Uh, and we say, uh, so for discrete time, we defined a martingale in ter terms of what happens in one time step, but there's uh, and in discrete time, that's the smallest possible time increment. In continuous time, there's no such thing as the smallest possible time increment. So we have to define things just a little bit differently. And we saw this also with continuous time Markov processes. We had to define, there was no one step transition probability matrix. Okay, so here's the definition. Xt is a martingale if it's conditional if the conditional expectation of xt, given the history up to some time s, and s can be anything less than or equal to t. s doesn't have to be t minus one because there's nothing special about one here. Uh, so if this conditional expectation is the same as xs, the value of the stochastic process at time s, okay. Uh, sorry, there should be no semicolon here, and this should be true for all s between naught and t. Uh, if this is true, we say that xt is a martingale. Okay, so this should hold for all s and t. 
uh, and in particular, just as in the discrete time case, by using the tower rule, this says that, or in this case, even without using it, it's part of the definition. Uh, the expected value of xt is the same as x0, the initial condition. We assume the initial condition is deterministic, but if you want it to be random, you should put another expectation here. Okay, so this is true for all fixed T and we want to know if the same is true for random times capital T. And we define stopping times the same way as in discrete time. Uh, the event that capital T is less than or equal to T should be, it should be possible to determine that just by looking at the history up to time T. And in this case, in continuous time, just to be precise, when I say history up to some time, I include that time. Okay, so it's up to and including that time. Okay, so that's stopping times. Okay, and this is our most important result. This is the one we are going to use a lot. And this is the main thing you need to know. So you need to understand the definition of a martingale you need to be able to show that a given process is a martingale, and then uh, you have to be able to apply the optional stopping theorem. And this is as much of martingales as we need in this unit. So here's the theorem. So suppose xt is a martingale, and we assume a bit more, it's a bounded martingale, meaning that its values are limited to some interval a, b. It can't take very big values or very big negative values. So xt is a bounded martingale, either in discrete or continuous time. And capital T is a stopping time, a random time. And it has to be finite. Okay, So uh, you have to stop. The process cannot run forever. So with probability 1, the process stops. Uh, if this is true, uh, then uh, the expected value of x at this random time is the same as the initial value. So this was the question that motivated us to define stopping times, and indeed it's true, but there are some slight technical conditions that are needed for it to be true. So take a moment to make sure you understand the statement of the theorem and all the terms that have gone into, uh, into stating it understand the definitions of all the terms. So X sub T is a stochastic process. It's a martingale. Capital T is a stopping time. Uh, and uh, so if we have a martingale and a stopping time, and there are some additional technical conditions, such as that the martingale should be bounded and the stopping time should be finite with probability one. If these conditions are satisfied, then uh, the expectation of the martingale stopped at the time t, so look, looked at at the time, random time t, uh, the expected value of the stop martingale is the same as the initial value. Okay, so that's the theorem. We won't prove this, uh, we are just going to use it. If you're interested in the proofs, there's a very nice course on martingales uh, taught by my colleague Martin Balas, and I recommend that highly. Uh, just a remark in passing, we've stated certain assumptions. You may have, those of you who have done the Martingale scores, or maybe even in probability two, saw the optional stopping theorem with different assumptions. In fact, boundedness is a very strong assumption, and we don't need it. Uh, you can restate the theorem with weaker assumptions, but then Weaker conditions on xt mean that you need somewhat stronger conditions on the stopping time t. We only assume that it's finite, that eventually you stop. Whereas if you don't assume much about xt, then you have to assume more about t. Maybe that it's finite mean or something about how quickly x can grow by the t before the stopping time. Okay. And those conditions can be more complicated to check, which is why I haven't bothered with stating this theorem in the most general form possible. I've stated it in a somewhat restricted form, but that's enough for this course, because all our 
uh, state, uh, processes will be finite state and hence they will be bounded uh, and um, there will be absorbing states which are reachable from everywhere else so the time to absorption will be finite with probability one because it's built on top of a finite state Markov chain. Okay, so that's uh, the optional stopping theorem. So uh, with all those preliminaries, let's get back to the water model. Uh, that was after all our motivation for introducing martingales. Uh, so let me remind you of the notation. Yt was the number of nodes in state one at time t. Uh, and our claim is that yt is a martingale. This process yt is a martingale. Uh, and we need to prove this in order to be able to uh, use the optional stopping theorem. Okay, so how do we prove this? There are a couple of different ways to do it. So here's one way. Let's look at the uh, so what do we have to prove? We have to prove that the expectation of y t plus s given the history up to time t is the same as y t. And we have to show that for all positive s. So we want to show that the increment between time t and t plus s has zero expectation. But rather than showing that for every possible finite sized increment, we are only going to show it for infinitesimal time intervals. Mm -hmm. So we look at what happens between time t and time t plus delta. We look at the change in y over this infinitesimal time interval and we take the expectation. Uh, and we have to condition on the history up to time t. So conditioned on the value of y t at time k and y is a Markov process. So to give you, tell you everything about the history, I, okay, I tell you everything about Ys uh, up to this time. And by the Markov property, what all this will be irrelevant, this conditional expectation will only depend on Yt equals k, right? That's the Markov property. Uh, because Yt plus, uh, the, the distribution of this random variable only depends on Yt. And so its expectation also only depends on yt. Now, what could happen over this small time interval delta? We already found that out. We wrote down the transition rates for this Markov process. There are only two things that could happen. You could go from k to k plus one. If you do that, then this value yt plus delta minus yt is one. Okay, so it increases by one with this probability, n minus k, k over n times delta, the width of the interval. So this difference is plus one with this probability. So you get this contribution to the change in expectation. Okay, plus little o delta, this is also the probability of this transition. And then the other possibility is yt goes from k to k minus one in which case this difference here is minus one and that change happens with the same probability k and minus k over n that there should be a close brackets here times delta plus little o delta that's this is the probability of the change and then you get a minus one so you get minus this okay so this should be a minus little o delta if you like but uh it it's the same thing. So by writing the law of delta, we are saying there's some function here. We don't know much about it beyond the fact that it goes to zero as delta goes to zero. In particular, we don't know whether it goes to zero through positive values or through negative values. And so it makes no difference whether we write plus little or delta or minus little or delta. Okay, so when we do this calculation, the order delta terms cancel out. So these two cancel out and give us zero and all we are left with is little o of delta. So in any infinitesimal time interval delta, the expectation changes by something that's vanishing compared to delta. It's, it's maybe of order delta squared or delta cubed or delta to the three over two. We don't know, but it's definitely 
uh, much smaller than delta. And then you can stitch this up and say over infinitesimal time intervals, if the change is this small, then over a finite time interval, it's again vanishing. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make that rigorous, uh, but we'll, in this course, we'll take it for granted that this reasoning is uh, rigorous enough, and this shows that uh, yt is a martingale. If you want to be rigorous, there's a way to do it. Uh, and the way to do it is to uh, start from this continuous time process and look at the jump chain. So look at what happens at the jump times of the continuous time Markov chain. And let me again remind you of the picture of a Markov process you should have in your mind. So uh, the state space is discrete, so the Markov process stays constant over some time at its current state. And after a random exponentially distributed time, it jumps to some other state. And then it stays constant at that value for a random exponential time and jumps to some other state and so on. So uh, it consists of the jump chain, which is a discrete time chain looked at just at the jump times where it moves between states. And then there's a random time spent in each state. These two things together describe the continuous time Markov process. Uh, but the, so the Markov process is constant between jumps and watched at the jump times, it's a discrete time chain. So the jump chain is a discrete time chain. And you can show by calculating the probabilities uh, that that discrete time chain gives rise to a discrete time martingale. And then, so yt looked at jump times as a martingale. It's a discrete time process and a martingale. And between jump times, it's a constant. So the expected value also remains constant between those times. And putting these two things together, you conclude that what you have is indeed a continuous time martingale. Uh, that's a more rigorous way of proving this result, but this is maybe more convenient and this is good enough for us in this course. <coughs> Okay, so having proved that yt is a martingale, we are now going to use the optional stopping theorem to answer the question we are interested in. As to what the probability is that yt gets absorbed in state n rather than in state zero. Okay, so let's define capital T to be the random time to hit an absorbing state, which is either zero or n. Uh, okay, and uh, you should convince yourself that t is a stopping time. You can decide by any time little t whether you have already hit the absorbing state or not. If you have been watching this process throughout that time, you can decide. Okay, it's also a bounded martingale. Yt is also a bounded martingale because it takes values only between naught and n, and t is finite, capital T, because it's a finite state Markov chain with absorbing uh, states, which can be reached from anywhere else. Uh, okay, so so we have checked, and it is important to check, so we've checked that the conditions in the statement of this theorem are satisfied. It's a bounded martingale, the stopping time is finite almost surely. And since the conditions in the theorem are satisfied, its conclusion holds, and its conclusion states that the expected value of the martingale stopped at time t is the same as its initial condition, why not? Okay, but what is the expected value at the stopping time? So at the stopping time, there are only two possible values for yt. It's either n or it's zero. So it's n with the unknown probability that it's n and it's zero with the unknown probability that it's zero. So if you calculate the expectation, you get n times the probability that it hits the state. It gets absorbed in the state n rather than in the state zero. Okay, so if your initial condition is k, then this whole thing should be k, which means the probability 
of hitting the state n of being absorbed in the state n should be k over n. And that's, that's our result. So we have calculated the probability uh, that the voter model reaches consensus with everyone having opinion one. Given that initially there were k people having opinion one, the probability that everybody ends up, all n people end up having opinion one is k over n. And the probability they all end up having opinion zero is one minus this. Okay, so we have determined uh, what happens to the Markov chain in the long run. It hits one of these two absorbing states and we have calculated the probability that it gets absorbed in each of these particular states as a function of the initial condition. Okay, so that's our first use of the optional stopping theorem. Uh, so do uh, take some time to make sure you understand the definition of a martingale, how we check that a given process is a martingale, how we check the conditions for the optional stopping theorem, and then how by using the theorem we were able to calculate the probabilities of interest. Uh, good, that concludes our discussion of, uh, uh, of, well, of this part of the water model on the complete graph, and next time we are going to look at it on arbitrary graphs. I'll stop the recording now.